That's quite an amazing um, video and performance. Uh, welcome, Doris Kreisler. Um, I'm really happy to have you on stream here. I think you, the connection froze. All right, we're having slight connection issues. Um, I'll just uh, introduce briefly. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with Doris Kreisler uh, on the fourth day of Korean Music Tech um, for a short Q&A session followed by a performance. Hi, Doris, can you hear me? All right, I think we have some connection issues. Okay, so Doris is uh, trying to reconnect. Um, the reason why we invited Doris today is because the Faramin uh, in 2020 turns 100 years old. Uh, that's why the video that you just saw was recorded. Um, it's called uh, Fairman 100. Um, and now Doris is back. I hope now you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Can you Great. hear me? Yes, yeah. now it's good. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just saying, um, like how excited we are to have you on. Um, how excited we are uh, to uh, look at this project together and share it with the audience and, and how excited I personally am to be able to talk about uh, this with you. Um, yeah, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, this video that you saw, it's, um, it marks for me a very special moment because it was filmed um, by wonderful uh, French filmmaker Marie Lossier uh, on a 16 millimeter Bolex at CERN, um, a place that was very difficult to gain you know, access to. And it was shot exactly on the weekend before the big um, international lockdown. So we went down there 40, 30 floors below. And when we finished and emerged again after two days, um, the world as we knew it was gone and all our flights and trains had been canceled and it was um, a very strange moment. So. So you, you mentioned it's it was difficult to to get access to it. Um, does that mean the, the organizational process of like oh, getting yeah. permission first, um, or also uh, actually on the day itself in terms of like security clearances and all that? Well, CERN, the the European Nuclear Research Center, is a um, is a truly fascinating place, and I recommend um, to everyone that can to to go and. Have have a look. It's truly inspiring, especially for um, artists, because um, it is um, a project on such a grand scale, solely serving the, the purpose of experimenting and trying to prove theories and find things. And, um, you know, it's um, it, it serves the purpose of research. So um, the territory where we had access um, to is um, usually locked off to the public um, and um, their radiation levels, you were forced to wear a helmet. Um, you saw that at some point you don't see my feet, you're not allowed to wear um, certain shoes, certainly not high heels. It's a highly restricted um, area. And so because I had collaborated in the past with um, um, physics and music festivals um that's why um we got the very special permission to shoot down there at the collider which um, um is a really just unique location and this weekend um cern was already closed down officially um and there were very few people there but um due to the incredible people um um, working there, our contacts that made the impossible possible, and we got a special access to be able to go down there and shoot. So, uh, what is it like? You mentioned you were down there for two days. Um, what is that like? Do you eat? Like, is there some type of canteen? Uh, where do you sleep? Is no, it like no, no. It's, 
it feels like you're being in the James Bond movie and you just have to take several elevators and, and kind of industrial, semi-secret looking passageways and uh, to, to just go deep down into the ground um, to access. And then what was really interesting is that um, the site itself is tremendously loud for, for a musician. There's this um, sound of thousands of voltage of electricity. And I wanted to incorporate it into composition, but, um, and I recorded it, but it's such a harsh, wild, bright twang that it's, it's, it's not very musical. But um, it, it's very, it, for me, the reference is like Metropolis. And that's why, you know, it has this really huge, big laboratory, um, which it is. So. And um, did, did this not, did this interfere in any way with, with the theremin or typically? The, yeah. Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting question, um, and there was a lot of um, fear about that. Um, you know, um, we brought down the uh, the Clara Vox, which is a new prototype um, that Moog Music um, had um, just literally has just thrown on the market, and there were worries that um, that the electromagnetic fields, because obviously the theremin always um, is very sensitive to all kind of interference, um, like for instance, eight um, sisters at concert halls interfere with the theremin or big light systems. But in this case, um, and maybe because of um, the unknown situation, we did um, use the theremin really just like a prop. Um, so we were, and um, a whole team from Moog Music was supposed to be there with us to supervise the technical aspects, but um, they were already unable to travel. So we had to skim down on, on things. We also couldn't get half of the equipment because it was already locked down from the school we were supposed to get it. So we had to work with, um, you know, meeting ends of what was available with a very tiny, small team. So you mentioned using it as a prop in um, in this piece or in this video. Um, did you have time to actually play around and experiment with the theremin, like just just on your own, to see uh, what would happen with with any interferences? Was there any interference? Um, there was unfortunately no time to really test oh. that, and I must say um, there were so many things on our mind to just be able to to manage to somehow um, be able to work and make this video that was over a year in the planning that um, we we literally there was no extra time for such um, exciting experiments hopefully there'll be other opportunities to test it again i mean it's something that one should have asked the the, the scientists there to see what their strategies would have been i think it probably would have worked just fine if you would have plugged it in i would assume and um so that was recorded um i assume you like many other musicians had all kinds of plans for the rest of the year um how's your year been and uh, and i'm curious also if you've uh, played around with uh, with live streaming as a medium uh, this is like a, a mm -hmm. hot topic of course for for any conference and for a lot of musicians to consider or um or not at all mm -hmm. well you just froze but um i okay Okay, back. Um, well, it's obviously been a big year of um, transition for all live musicians. And um, the idea or the original idea of playing live streams and next to your pot plant in your living room was a very unpleasant thought because the obvious loss of um, sound I think we've 
Los Dorets. Uh, we do have um, something uh, by Dorets uh, that we'll show right now, uh, which is a performance that she did during uh, during the um, lockdown instead of another performance. Um, so I suggest we look at that and I will try to get Dorit back uh, as quickly as possible to talk about um, about how that came together and what it replaced. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for for sending the this uh, interpretation of Sati uh, in uh, and sharing it with us. Can you tell a little bit about um, about the setting and and the occasion for that performance? Yes. So um, the Theremin 
applies to uh, contemporary new sounds, but it also is interesting to try to tap into, um, you know, classical um, repertoire. And um, last year I was uh, scheduled to perform uh, in front of Monet's Water Lilies at the L'Orangerie for several days. Um, to perform at this very unique location in Paris. Um, and then the lockdown happened. And what happened was that I think, you know, I'm not the only one. It was first postponed a few more months and then another few more months until it was finally canceled. So instead of performing in Paris behind um, the water lilies, I uh, was um, in lockdown in my hometown, Graz, Austria. And um, I chose the goldfish pond at my aunt's garden and uh, in a slightly melancholic way instead shot um, a version of that um, interpretation at her at her pond so that's the background story of that video it's great so then um i mean everyone should stay tuned to hear more Ferriman because at the end of this q a uh, we'll have a special performance for um the korean music tech uh, viewers, um, while the, while I was playing, we were talking a little bit about um, essentially the future uh, of Ferramen, but also the past. So uh, last year marks the the, the hundred uh, year anniversary of the Ferramen. Um, how do you look back on on the history of the the Ferramen and uh, and maybe your relation to it, and what do you see? going forwards and going forward at this very specific point in time, uh, which meant the 100th birthday of this instrument um, and of this medium of music was celebrated in lockdown somehow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do think it's a very interesting time because um, we literally have to now find um, the new sound of the future because the the present is a gray zone and the past as we knew it is, you know, we will never go back to that again. So I would hope that possibly the theremin could be perhaps one of the instruments contributing. It seems that um, there might be a good time for all the establishment being struck down, ripped apart, and it might leave some light and open space for, for new different things to, to come in and, and, and gain a little um, light in the sun. And the theremin, despite being the first electric instrument um, 100 years ago, it never really found its um, true form. It never really got um, established in the pantheon of music instrument, it still is uh, misinterpreted, underestimated. Um, there is not much interesting repertoire yet. There are not enough, even though growing um, interpreters of it. And it is a very um, modern instrument in a way that um, the body is the interface that produces the sound through the slightest motion by interacting the electromagnetic field of um, created by the theremin instrument so it really relates to modern technology in a very primal literally literal way motion to sound and um, i think that offers a lot of opportunity to apply it in in new ways establish it also more in in classical and you know culturally established um forms as well as um, all kinds of new genres um, so i do think it's an interesting time for the theremin actually it, what you said made me think of something and actually uh we met some years ago probably something like four years ago um at another conference uh, um, where you were talking about the theremin and i didn't make the connection then um, but when you were describing um kind of the the physicality and using you know the space and motion to interact with it I, it actually made me think a little bit of virtual reality yes um, and i'm curious if you uh, have any thoughts about how those mediums might complement each other or play into each other or amplify each other 
Um, I do think there's a lot of potential. In fact, there is a tech company sending me their Oculus right now, um, applying the musical Theremin app with some three-dimensional technology. So I do think, um, I would think that there are a lot of people thinking about that and combining the dots. And um, to come back to the CERN video, I wanted to have the the birth of electric music symbolized in a video that actually placed it in a scientific location and to really merge technology and sound um, to, to kind of, um, yeah, point in that direction. Um, we have a question from YouTube that I want to ask, by the way, if anyone, uh, if you're watching the stream and you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, we can feature them here on the screen and in the session. I'll just read it out loud for everyone who, uh, who cannot see it. Uh, I, it is a question from Lucas M on YouTube. I'd love to know how the Fairman became, um, Dolly, your instruments of choice, uh, and whether you've got experience with other instruments and how the learning curves are there? So it's a good question. Um, I have been teaching Theremin a lot, or I've been trying to introduce the instrument to other people because of many misconceptions. And I do think that whether you've played an instrument for many years or have never learned one, you are pretty much in equal position, which is nice to learn the Theremin because the the process of playing it is so different than traditional instruments. So you completely have to rewire your brain and dive into this tiny microtonal, slowed down physical space. So perhaps if you've studied other instruments before, um, it helps you to just have a general structure of how to approach learning an instrument that might be helpful but other than that um it is really wide open and accessible to everyone and it really depends on what your goals are and what you would like to do with it and i do hope that more people will really um, get to play the theremin well and get excited about it if someone wants to pick up the the theremin um a few a few questions come to mind like uh, about for instance barriers like what is the cost of such a device but also resources like where should people research or what should people watch in order to kind of educate themselves mm -hmm. about the instruments um well like when you you know when you get a synthesizer electronic music instruments you have um references of music you like there are more and more resources these days. Um, there are techniques that have been developed um, for playing the theremin um, and different strategies about it. Um, uh, I have helped co-found the New York Theremin Society and um, you can go on that website, uh, newyorktheremonsociety.org and they offer online, these days, online theremin uh, classes in groups or individuals and um, there are a few other theremin players, one in England, Lydia Kavina, and one in Germany, um, Karina Eick, that also teach how to play the theremin. Personally, I think, of course, being in the same room makes a huge difference than doing that over the screen. And um, I personally also am not really um, so much about studying specific um, finger positions because with the theremin, you don't touch anything and you, you're literally constantly intonating in the air. Um, so the finger positions are a certain kind of balance, um, but it really depends on where you want to take the instrument. And it's playing a theremin, it feels as if you're balancing on one leg on a step of stairs and from note to note, you're trying to hop onto the next one. It's a lot about intonation and very close related to string instruments i guess but you have to do that as well and um and in terms of resources or people besides Which yourself that they should follow um say again resources in terms of how to learn or which instrument type to get is that what you um yeah exactly so if, if someone wants to educate themselves um mm -hmm. about the theremin are there 
maybe I, I don't know actually youtubers that are interesting to like follow or um yes. or great uh, websites yes, yeah. or yeah so i yeah there are there are lots of theremin tutorials and they're all of very different kind depending on the style um and approach of the individual feminists so you can really just go through these things and choose what matches your personal um goal and desire um uh, there is carolina ike who's very active on youtube who posts a lot of playing videos um there is a there's a big community um and um yeah again new york fairman society.org and um there is um, a Fairman compilation that might also interest you. It, um, it's on Bandcamp and um, it features 50 Fairman players from uh, uh, 17 countries. And so if you, if you listen to all these different approaches of what people do with the Fairman, um, it gives you um, an impression of how versatile the instrument is. And there you can pick a player that you like, whose style you like, and most likely they might also be giving some classes or have some uh, tutorials on YouTube so you can kind of wade through the jungle of um, players and find uh, one that's inspiring you. So that would be my recommendation. Um, so another question that came in is yeah. um, whether has Moog tried to improve the pheromone sounds and are there pheromones with different kinds of timbres? Um, that's a good question. So one of the reasons the Fairman has still not been as popular and established as um, I wished it would have been um, is because we didn't really have professional instruments. So we do have a very um, good new prototype on the market and um, it's a bit costly and I would hope that um, they would also throw a cheaper version on the market sometime soon. Um, and that one really plays much easier. Um, so, and there's a lot of variation with the timbres. In fact, with that carolox, I have whoop, I have one here. Um, you can actually um, uh, use an iPad and, like in a synthesizer, change the curves and the filters of the two oscillators. So you have a tremendous variety triggering um, the theremin with the Thurman interface, but having all these synthesizer sounds inside its body. And um, that really opens, I mean, it kind of merges the, these two technologies of synthesis and um, the Thurman heterodyning. And that really will be very interesting to see what people will be doing with that and where they will go with that. So in terms of timbres, as you specifically asked, there are literally hundreds of possibilities, yeah. There's one question, and um, uh, I don't fully understand the question, but hopefully you will, because I'm not the Fairman player, you are. Uh, yeah. It's a question from Thomas uh, Richter on YouTube. Can you actually play a Fairman from another continent? Is there a low latency yeah. way of doing this from another place? Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting question. So obviously you can, all the Fairmans work on different continents if you use the right voltage. Um, for them, um, the low latency. Uh, yeah, I don't specifically know what that is referring to, but um, this. Some of my parents have been to up to um, four or five continents, and there was no problem. Um, there are other things, like for instance, strong wind. If you play outside, that can interfere, um, or as said before, lighting circles. Um, circuits uh, or objects. I mean, whenever you turn a thermon on, every object in the room is interfering and you have to calibrate it, which is like tuning, fine tuning your audi audible range, um, taking in consideration the location where you are. So it's a matter of calibration and correct voltage, otherwise there shouldn't be a problem. Um, I wanted to, to ask about, so the Clarivox, um, I think officially, like the full title was even the Clara Fox Centennial was um, released to celebrate the, the hundred year birthday of the pheromon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's remarkable or like important to know that it, rather than naming it's after Leon Pheromon, again, it was named after 
uh, Clara Rockmore. Um, can you tell the viewers a little bit about Clara Rockmore and why she's so important for the pheromone? Um, yes, so um, Clara Rockmore literally was the first female electronic music pioneer. And um, uh, I am very, very um, humble and proud to say that um, Mo consulted me among many other people for suggestions for the name and I pitched Clara Vox to them and they took it. So um, I really am very happy that this tribute paid to her. I mean, she toured with this instrument in the mid twenties and um, it's an absolutely um, revolutional moment in music history to apply this instrument. She toured along with Paul Robeson and um, unfortunately she said she didn't place many concerts as she wanted to do because it was technically difficult to transport the pheromon. She also states in, a, in an interview that um, there was sometimes trouble with orchestras. The union of the orchestra was very worried about the pheromon being um, taking things away from them. Um, it's a really fascinating story and she really, really deserves some um, more attention. And uh, this instrument can sound really beautiful. Uh, and um, yeah, it's wonderful that it honors her. I you think could it's should, everyone should go check out her performances on YouTube if you haven't seen Clara Rockmore um, play the theremin. She put the bar pretty high for all of us. I think it's such an interesting time and the pioneers in that time are so interesting to watch because I think there was so much concern also about uh, recording music and what that would do to music and, and radio, just in general, like the, the influences of modern technology. Uh, but then uh, to have an instrument like a pheromone um, in that story at the same time is amazing. Um, yeah, back to today, before we, before we go to your performance, uh, a question we get from... Uh, Matthias Röder on Facebook, uh, who are the great composers for Fermin solo today? Um, that's a very good question. Unfortunately, um, we're lacking um, tremendous contemporary repertoire for Fermin. So um, I encourage all of the composers listening here to, to write um, for one or several pheromone ensembles. Um, I literally cannot name any contemporary composers other than compositions by theremin players themselves. Um, uh, the theremin has seven octaves and um, one of the issues also for contemporary repertoire is that um, there is not even a specific notation yet existing that captures um, what the theremin really can do, because you can apply the theremin playing melodies written for violin or cello or piano, but there's also a whole other gestural and microtonal aspect that you can apply with the theremin with its many colors. And to be able to notate those down is still something that also has not been fully established. So there are a few missing links and it might still take some more time, but. Uh, it would be exciting to have more repertoire. So if there are composers, if there are composers listening or viewing this right now and they're interested, they should get in touch with you? They absolutely may, and I'm happy to support in, and inform in any way. And um, yes, I'm personally dreaming and I have a few times put together Thurman orchestras because I think if you have five to ten pheromones play at the same time. It's such a unique weaving sound color that no other instrument can create. And um, we now have enough players good enough to be able to actually um, perform such compositions. We just don't have the works for it yet. It would be incredibly exciting. Great. Um, what, what do the next um, years or what does the next year look for you? Are you uh, working on any projects that you want to share? Um. Um, I think for, for all artists and especially, you know, I used to perform once a week live and, and go from concert to concert. It's really, it's really hard with this long break. And I feel 
and I wonder and I worry how many musicians will kind of lose their craft because you do need the energy from the outside, from the audience when you when you play. Um, but aside from that, it is a good time to do the other part of work, which is to produce and to write and to um, finish things. So. I'm currently um, remixing a soundtrack I wrote for a six-part TV series, a remake of M, um, which features only theremin and analog music. So to release that on vinyl, um, uh, then also working on a solo record, there will be a theater dance production starting in the next year. And currently I'm recording for a Theremin Broadway um, musical radio play, um, wow. which is also really fun. So as a theremin player, there are so many. Um, I also got a beautiful track from a British producer called Fene. Um, so there's so many different styles and, 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 and uh, ways you can apply this instrument and can be challenged by it. So. Um, that is really exciting. And I'm also um, doing Fairman teachings online, usually before I taught having 10 people in a circle playing together in the same room. So you kind of create these Fairman orchestras. And um, I cannot wait to go back to that. That's where. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, that, that's cool. What was it? Cool kids? Uh, okay. Cool, Kid Cool Fairman School, yeah. And then there are performances scheduled in the summer, in the fall, but um, I must say, uh, promoters are so hesitant and so scared. And, you know, it, I really admire all the organizers right now, you know, putting on shows and wanting to create real lifetime festivals. It is an incredible challenge with all these unknown factors of constant change. So. So I'm not even promoting any concert because I'm not sure if it's ever going to happen. Yeah, well, fingers crossed at least um, that we'll get to to some type of new normal. So um, I want to ask you about your performance. Before we uh, do that, um, um, I, I want to say to everyone, uh, first of all, who's viewing this, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we have uh, more program tomorrow and another performance. So please check uh, karemmusictech.com for that. Uh, we started 3.30 p.m. CET, uh, but now I'm really excited to uh, to hear uh, your perform uh, performance, uh, Doris. Um, what can you say uh, about it? Um, what are you playing? And um, yeah, what is the idea behind it? And why this for, for this context? Um, it is um, a pre-recorded um, performance of a little while ago, and um, I chose it um, for this uh, specific conference because I felt that it showcases the theremin uh, in its application for composition from a few different angles. And, and is it... Is it your own uh, composition or is it improvisation? Um, it's all original works. Um, a lot of it are excerpts from uh, the previously mentioned movie soundtrack. Um, yeah, so it's very, yeah, it's cine cinematic. Right. Then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And uh, with me, all the viewers. Thank you, uh, Doris Keisler. And um, please uh, stay in touch. We will do. Thanks so much for having me. Enjoy.